For many nations across Sub-Saharan Africa, the legacy of European colonialism remains a fact of existence. In Cameroon, the nation finds itself torn between the Francophone government and Anglophone separatists. And although frustrations emerged briskly a few years ago, the origins of the standoff traces back to the colonial era and the infamous scramble for Africa. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. I did promise you, now you could die before we. <coughs> and remember, if you never kill till the last one, no man no could stop. Till you bury the last one, till the last one is buried. I'm out here! I'm out here! If we are not kill till the last one, Amba no could stop. In September 2017, a band of English-speaking militias, known as the Ambazonia Defense Forces, declared their independence from the French-speaking federal government. The rebels claim that the Anglophones in Cameroon are politically and economically marginalized due to the federal government's infringement on their autonomous rights. They also claim that the English-speaking Southern Cameroon's region was illegally annexed in the 1960s. Now, the term Southern Cameroons is somewhat confusing, because it comes from the British designation for the southern frontier of their former Nigerian colony. Thus, even though it's called Southern Cameroons, the area in question is actually located in the west of Cameroon by the border of Nigeria. Moreover, Southern Cameroons is officially split into the northwest and southwest regions, and in late 2016 it was the site of demonstrations by Anglophone lawyers, teachers and students who took to the streets to express their grievances. Meanwhile, the French-speaking government responded with a typical crackdown, which, not surprisingly, backfired and fueled an even stronger sense of identity politics. The only way to understand this peculiar standoff is to examine Cameroon's colonial past. In the mid-19th century, British missionary Alfred Saker and his community of freed slaves arrived by the mouth of the Vuri River. Together, they founded the city of Victoria, now called Limbe. For the next 30 years, English was taken up as the common language in the coastal area and gradually spread along the border of the British Nigerian colony into Central Africa. This development was apart from the other territories of Cameroon, which were not yet colonized at the time. Still, the influx of English laid the bedrock of the Ambazonian identity. In 1884, as the European powers formalized the scramble for Africa during the Berlin Conference, Imperial Germany laid a claim for Cameroon. As such, an agreement was reached between the Germans and the indigenous tribes, resulting in the German Protectorate of Cameroon. For practical purposes, however, Berlin was barely involved in the direct administration of its colonial holdings, relying instead on the trading companies that were seeking to seize and exploit Africa's natural resources. For the Germans, Cameroon was a means to an end, with the goal being to dislodge the other European rivals in the region. Yet Germany's designs were promptly shattered by its defeat in World War I, resulting in the unconditional loss of German colonial holdings in Africa. With the dissolution of the German Empire, also came the effective dissolution of the Cameroon colony. The armed nation must be prepared to make their contribution in disarmament. The disarmed nation wants justice, and a German pure and simple will be the most heartbreaking confession of failure. The League of Nations appointed Great Britain and France as trustees of Germany's colonial territory. Yet, in pursuit of their own interests, the leadership in London and Paris split the entirety of Cameroon among themselves and governed over the area as they saw fit. In a situation that is comparable with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where the British and French carved territories from the Ottoman Empire, an artificial border was drawn along the parameters of modern-day Nigeria and Cameroon. The French-controlled territories, which accounted for most of the land, were renamed East Cameroon. Meanwhile, the long stretch of land by the Nigerian border, where the English language was predominant, came under British control and was renamed West Cameroon. In addition, as if things were not confusing enough, British-controlled Cameroon was further split in southern and northern Cameroons. 
The effective takeover of Cameroon was aggravated by the fact that Paris and London enforced completely different forms of governance. While the British largely left the affairs in the hands of the local English-speaking chiefs, which strengthened the Ambazonian identity, France took a more heavy-handed approach. For instance, the French colonial administration took a direct role in overseeing taxation, courts, education and economic matters. France highly involved itself in the ordinary lives of the tribal people, in an attempt to cement its culture, traditions and language in the heart of the African continent. On the other hand, French Cameroon was less democratic than its counterpart, and suppressed the growing nationalist movement within its territories. Essentially, the two governing philosophies of the British and the French could not have been more different, and the decades-long experience of the two colonial administrations contributed to the formation of two distinct nations. British Cameroon would remain Anglophone in culture and craft its justice, educational and social system according to British standards, while retaining ideas of limited governance. At the same time, French Cameroon was successful in creating a francophone ruling elite who emulated French traditions of centralized power, and a population that used French as a common language in a sea of indigenous ethnicities. The end of World War II brought about the rapid decline of the European powers' control over their colonial holdings. By the turn of the year, in 1960, pressure from independence movements and domestic dissidents forced the French government to formally grant Cameroon its independence. In the meantime, the status of British Cameroons fell into a state of flux, and the United Nations intervened by calling for a vote. The local populations of southern and northern Cameroons were given two options in a referendum. They could either join the newly independent Nigeria or unite with the rest of Cameroon. Despite the local desire for a fully sovereign Ambazonia, British policymakers did not believe that an independent state was economically viable. Plus, they wanted to shape Africa's decolonization in their favor, so that the English-speaking territories would still have close connections to London. As a result, the United Nations removed the independence option from the referendum ballot. Once again, even in decolonization, colonial rivalry sealed the political course of the African continent. A year later, the votes were cast. While Northern Cameroons voted to join Nigeria, Southern Cameroons joined the Independent Republic of Cameroon. Although Southern Cameroons shared the English language and heritage with Nigeria, the local elites feared that their region would lose all autonomy to the much larger Nigerian government. So, to preserve the local autonomy, joining the smaller government of Cameroon made sense. Afterwards, representatives of Southern Cameroons met with President Amadi Aicho and reached a verbal agreement on reunification. The Anglophones came away from the meeting believing that they had been promised a new constitution to be part of a federal government, where all constituent federalized states would have autonomy. What happened instead is that President Ahiju embraced a constitution that concentrated authority in the federal government's capital, Yaoundé. The only concession the Anglophones received in return were legislative seats that assured some representation. Believing that they had been deceived by their Francophone counterparts and that the British had abandoned them, the Anglophone representatives reluctantly accepted Ahiju's proposed constitution and sealed the deal for a unified federal Cameroon in September 1961. A decade later, however, Ahiju had a change of heart owing to the French advisors that surrounded him. In pursuit of absolute authority, his government amended the constitution and replaced the federal state with a unitary state, thereby further centralizing power in the francophone capital, Yaoundé. Moreover, southern Cameroons was split into smaller administrative districts that all reported directly to the presidency, rendering the effective autonomy of southern Cameroons almost non-existent. Thereupon, the federal government enforced a series of anti-English reforms, including measures that forced the Anglophones to cut all ties to the United Kingdom, as well as symbolic revisions such as driving on the right side of the road and the introduction of the Central African franc currency 
which reduced the purchasing power of the English-speaking community. The policy of Yaoundé was designed to forcefully assimilate the Anglophones, but also to keep them divided internally. As such, over the course of the decades, the political elite of the Anglophones became dependent on the federal government for support and in fact competed with one another. Ahiju remained in office until 1982 and was succeeded by Paul Biya, who largely maintained the centralized and francophone-focused policies. Much like his forerunner, President Biya has sought to further divide the Anglophones of Cameroon and bring them closer to the francophone identity. But in November 2016, the Anglophone frustrations erupted, resulting in strikes and protests that were met with violence and government-sanctioned internet outages. Since then, the Anglophone movement has grown to the point where secessionists have taken up arms against the federal government. The convoy of the governor of the southwest region in the troubled Anglophone part of Cameroon came under attack on Tuesday. The administrator was on the way to visit the Kumba General Hospital, which was attacked and sent a place on Monday. The Kumba General Hospital led to many deaths and hundreds of arrests. In the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, Cameroon's crisis is not unique. Many states in the periphery have seen civil conflicts about the character of their nations. Yet, at heart, the Anglophone crisis is the legacy of colonialism and the fact that the federal political leaders have lost sight of the root of the situation. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Tom Henderson for helping me research this topic. And credit goes to our contributors on Patreon for giving us the means to produce content like this. Now, if you want to gain access to sources, PDF files, early access, etc., visit our crowdfunding page on patreon.com slash caspianreport for more information. In any case, thank you for your time and soul.